We see Frank and Joe on the cover. Who are the other people standing behind them? Well, these two are Frank and Joe from the next book, and these two are Frank and Joe from the book after. Did they think no one would notice the Hardy Boys are on the cover three times? Argofon book review, Argofon book review. For today's mission, the Hardys are going undercover on a reality TV show. They'll live in a house with 12 other teenagers for the chance to win a million dollars. If this story sounds familiar, that's because they reused it from the third graphic novel, Madhouse. The Hardys also competed in a reality TV show in Book 16. They've done this a lot! For their cover, the Hardys are pretending to be brothers who are separated at birth. They figure that dramatic story will work well on TV. The Hardys being long-lost brothers is a neat idea. It could have been a good angle to this book. But sadly, the book does absolutely nothing with it. When the Hardys arrive, they immediately run into the book's main problem. 15 characters is too many to keep track of. It's hard to remember who is who, especially with the minor characters. Like, I have no idea who Olivia, Mary, and Hal are. I remember Wilson's big introduction. He says he's here to find a girlfriend, just like the reality show Princess and Nerd. That sounds like a great show. I want to watch it. But after that, Wilson basically disappears from the story. The same with Mikey the chubby guy, Mary the homeschool kid, and Silent Girl who almost never talks. Rosemary is probably the best of the background characters. She constantly talks about percentages. It's kind of annoying, but at least I remembered who she is. Here are the important characters. That is, the characters who appear in more than four scenes. Ripley Lansing is a minor celebrity with a reputation as a spoiled brat. Bobby T is a famous blogger who never shuts up about himself. James Sittenfield is a jerk to everyone. For no reason, he's just a jerk. I suspect he's Brian Conrad in disguise. Kit Elroy is a peppy girl who wants to be an actress and always shows off for the cameras. Kit casually mentions that a murder took place here 10 years ago. The only witness was four-year-old Anna. Gee, that would make her about the same age as all the other contestants, wouldn't it? The host of the show is Veronica Wilmont. The show is called Deprivation House. They force teenagers to become deprived by taking away their phones and music and stuff like that. The idea is that the teenagers will freak out because they don't have their phones. It could be an interesting show, but here's the problem. If you do freak out, you get kicked off the show. So everyone acts normally and pretends nothing's going on. It's kind of boring. The show also has challenges. The first challenge is dishwashing in a swimming pool. A weird challenge. Frank finds a dead body in the swimming pool. The murder victim's a production assistant. I don't know why, but the Hardys don't investigate his death. You would expect the great detectives to solve the murder mystery, but they don't even try to do that. They mostly ignore the murder. Talk about a detective failure. In Joe's defense, he can't solve a murder mystery right now because he's too busy getting a girlfriend. Kind of. He and Bryn regularly sneak off by themselves. She asks questions that make you think. Like, what's the opposite of a pufferfish? Joe finds it fascinating. I didn't know he was into weird girls. The culprit puts red jello into the shower head so it looks like blood is coming out. Again, Kit mentions four-year-old Anna saw a murder here. It turns out everyone got a death threat at the start of the competition. This means the Hardys got a death threat four chapters ago, and they didn't mention it until just now. Why did they leave that out of the story? The second challenge is to collect hundreds of cockroaches in the kitchen. It's gross. Not long after, the culprit puts peanut oil in Bobby T's toothpaste in order to give him an allergy attack. Frank proves there was peanut oil inside the toothpaste using a testing strip from ATAC. 
It's super convenient that ATAC just happened to give him peanut oil testing strips ahead of time. Also, this means the Hardys got a bunch of spy gadgets from ATAC five chapters ago, and they didn't mention it until just now. Why did they leave that out of the story? Olivia tries to form an alliance with Frank and two other people. It's a good idea to get her help, because Olivia is a way better detective than the Hardys. She uncovers motives for Bobby T and Ripley, and hey, did she mention Anna's mother was murdered here ten years ago? Veronica introduces the Deprivation Chamber, which is a confessional that no one ever uses what was the point of even putting it in the book. The culprit traps Bobby T, James, and Joe in the sauna. Frank saves them by knocking the door down with a chainsaw. It was pretty cool, but Rosemary is so scared she quits the show. The next challenge is to give dogs a bath. The culprit poisons Joe's dog, so it goes crazy and tries to attack him. The culprit also sends everyone a threatening email. The Hardys don't think to forward the email to their tech guy, even though he could easily identify the culprit in seconds. Veronica reminds everyone, Anna saw her mother get murdered in this house. Boy, the characters keep mentioning this, don't they? Kit is kicked off the show. I'm not sure how I feel about this. Couldn't they have kicked off one of the minor characters instead? What was the point of giving Kit a quarter of the focus when she's kicked out and never seen again? The Hardys decide to check the next challenge for sabotage. They convince Wilson to quit the show as a distraction. Then they use another spy gadget, which wasn't mentioned before. It disables the cameras outside of Veronica's room, so they can go inside and search. They find Veronica's notes, along with $25,000 cash hidden in the ceiling. The next challenge is a lawnmower race. The Hardys find a bomb there. Veronica arrives and thanks the Hardys for saving everyone's lives. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. Veronica arrives and throws a fit because they saw what the next challenge is. That is cheating. Veronica threatens to sue the Hardy boys and she immediately kicks them off the show. I was surprised by Veronica's overreaction here. She never said it was against the rules to see what the challenge is. And it's not like they're hiding the challenge. It's set up in the yard outside. Anyone could see it by looking out the window. Veronica's assistant, Mitch, puts the Hardys in a spare cottage. Mitch gives himself away as the culprit by mentioning something he shouldn't know. Mitch is a criminal. He hid the money in the house last year. He probably could have gotten the money back by sneaking into Veronica's room, just like the Hardys did. Instead, he concocted this elaborate murder plot to get the show shut down so he can get his money back. When the Hardys escape, Mitch knocks them out and ties them up. They escape from him a second time, and Joe gets to the lawnmower bomb just in time to save Bryn's life. Oh, she is definitely going to be his girlfriend now. As a reward... The Hardys are let back on the show. Veronica reminds everyone that four-year-old Anna saw a murder ten years ago, and she introduces a new contestant named Gail. This brings the number of contestants up to twelve, which is still too many characters to keep track of. If you haven't read one of these trilogies before, books one and two always end with the same cliffhanger. Right after the culprit is arrested, a new culprit magically appears, so they can stretch out the story for another book. The end. Post-book follow-up. This book wasn't good. The situation is interesting, but the characters are bad. Even the characters that get a decent amount of focus could use some improvement, like James. If we had the same scenario with half as many characters, the book would be instantly improved. The story is kind of weak. It's a series of reality show challenges and sabotage incidents. That, that's all that happens. We just jump from one event to the other. The Hardys rarely investigate anything. And it's especially egregious that they ignore the actual murder in favor of figuring out who put Jello in the shower heads. I also didn't like how the Hardys forgot to mention they got threats and spy gadgets until five chapters after the fact. 
would this book work as a standalone mystery? Not really, over half the characters are pointless. I can only assume they're being saved as characters for the next two books in the trilogy? Overall, I did not like this book, the characters aren't good, and the reality TV show angle, while interesting, was not thought out. Like, why is there a lawnmower race on a show that's about kids losing cell phones? Who thought teenagers have their phones taken away is a good premise for a TV show anyway? I give Hardy Boys Undercover Brothers number 22, Deprivation House, a 4 out of 10.